The FAA closes Blue Origin's mishap investigation, Artemis II's boosters are in town, and SpaceX's new crew tower is growing like a rocket. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 29th of September, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Sponsored by Brilliant. After much anticipation, NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission has finally returned samples from asteroid Bennu back to Earth. The OSIRIS-REx sample return capsule successfully touched down in the Department of Defense's Utah Test and Training Range on September 24 at 1452 UTC. The capsule had entered the Earth's atmosphere just 10 minutes prior while traveling at about 12 kilometers per second and sustaining up to 32 Gs of deceleration. Soon after the landing, recovery teams were deployed near the landing spot, which was conveniently located near a road. That's probably one of the most hilarious things about this event. It barrels through space on this few billion kilometers long trip, it enters the atmosphere sustaining tremendous temperatures and forces, and somehow it manages to conveniently land near a road. What are the odds? I bet someone's already drafting up a conspiracy theory about that. Well, thankfully, upon successful touchdown, the capsule was confirmed to be all safe and sound with no cracks and it was carefully transported to a temporary clean room to prepare the samples for transport to NASA's Johnson Space Center. With the samples safely in Houston, operations are now underway to examine them and start preliminary studies. NASA says that it will reveal the first results of this in a press conference set for October 11th. But not all of the sampled material will be studied. About two-thirds of it are set to be put into long-term storage for future examination later with improved technology and methods. This is a policy that we've seen in the past with moon samples, for example. With the completion of this part of the mission, the U.S. has now become the second country to return samples from an asteroid after the Hayabusa 1 and Hayabusa 2 missions from Japan. This week, the FAA announced it had closed the mishap investigation for Blue Origin's New Shepard 23 mission. If you remember, this mission took place on September 12, 2022, and it was a routine launch of New Shepard with science payloads on board. However, one minute into the flight, the routine turned into an anomaly, and the abort system on New Shepard's capsule activated, pulling it away to safety. According to the FAA, the proximate cause of this mishap was the structural failure of the engine's nozzle caused by higher-than-expected engine operating temperatures. This lines up with the findings Blue Origin published back in March of this year, where the company indicated that, quote, design changes made to the engine's boundary layer cooling system accounted for an increase in the nozzle heating and explained the hot streaks present. The FAA states that the Blue Origin-led investigation has identified 21 corrective actions to implement, including a redesign of the engine and nozzle components to improve the structural performance during operations. The FAA also stated that even though the mishap report is now complete, Blue needs to prove that it has implemented all corrective actions and receive a launch license modification before resuming flights. Sounds familiar, huh? If you said yes, it's because you've probably heard about this recently, but with Starship. DOS had a whole video explaining what the deal was with the mishap investigations and the steps that were needed after that. It'll pretty much hold true for this investigation as well, but obviously in this case it's a different rocket, launching from a different location with a different purpose. So basically the regulatory process is the same, it just won't look exactly the same because it's not for the same things. For instance, the whole mishap investigation for New Shepard has taken about a year, whereas for Starship it took only five months. And that's despite it coming out with three times more corrective actions identified and needing to be implemented. Despite all of this, one interesting comment from the FAA that was included in this press release was the mention of organizational changes at the company identified as part of the corrective actions. The whole statement literally includes that at the end. This kind of makes you raise an eyebrow, since it was also reported this week that Blue Origin CEO Bob Smith is departing the company at the end of the year. According to reports from multiple media, the CEO would retire from the company on December 4th, and Amazon executive Dave Limp would be put in his place instead. It's not clear whether this change will bring a new focus to the company and whether the programs within it will shift gears and be more ferociter rather than gratitim. But whatever happens, it appears that things will soon be changing at Blue Origin, and hopefully for the better. 
Up next, we'll be looking at all the launches that happened this week. But first, here's Sawyer with a word from our sponsor. Thanks, Alicia. I wanted to talk about, wait, stop, I'm from the future. Is that even possible? Well, you can find out for yourself using the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is continually adding new math, science, and computer-related lessons to their library of thousands that make learning easy. And yes, they have an entire course on scientific thinking, and one of the lessons is about time travel. Oh, is that the one where you can get an idea of when events are happening relative to each other? Exactly. As long as it's in your light cone, which you can learn more about inside the lesson. You're gonna tell me now that to get a 30-day free trial, all our viewers have to do is go to brilliant.org slash NASA spaceflight or click the link in the description below, right? Exactly. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Okay, okay, I gotta ask, do I have a girlfriend in the future? Hey, I'm a time traveler, not a miracle worker, okay? Now, I know Alicia has some awesome stuff still to talk about, but I won't spoil the future. I'll let you keep watching. Alicia? Thanks, Sawyer. And along the lines of all this wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff, let's take a look back at This Week in Launches. A Falcon 9 lifted off on September 24th at 338 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The rocket was carrying a batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. The booster for this mission, B-1060, was flying for a 17th time, tying it with B-1058 for most flights of a Falcon booster. As is usual now, the booster successfully returned back to Earth, landing on the deck of SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. Fun fact, this was the third launch in a row from this pad that happened to be at 11.38pm local time, aka 3.38 UTC. Interesting, huh? Another Falcon 9 took off on September 25th at 8.48 UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg. It carried another 21 Starlink V2 mini-satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage, B-1075, was flying for a sixth time, and it landed on SpaceX's drone ship Of Course I Still Love You. With this launch, SpaceX has now launched 5,178 Starlink satellites, of which 351 have re-entered, and 4,199 are now in operational orbit. This Chongzheng 4C rocket lifted off on September 26 at 2015 UTC from the South Launch Site 2 at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. It was carrying another Yaogan military reconnaissance satellite for the Chinese government. This was the fourth Yaogan 33 satellite, and it adds to the recent streak of Yaogan satellite launches from the Chinese military. For those counting at home, this is the sixth Yaogan launch in just two months. One of the more surprising launches this week came from Iran, of all countries. A Kassed rocket launch took place on September 27th, and while the exact launch time is not known, it's thought to have occurred at around 6 o'clock UTC. The launch occurred from the Sharud Military Test Site, which is the launch base for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Aerospace Force, the one in charge of this launch. As is usual for launches from Iran, there was no previous notice that this was going to take place, and it was only made public after the Iranian government confirmed a successful mission. The mission is notable as it's the second launch this year from Iran's military forces after a failure of another rocket, the Ka'im 100, earlier this year. Despite this, this group has had much more success lately with their launches than their civil counterpart, the Iranian Space Agency. According to Iran's government, the Qasad rocket was carrying the NOR-3 military reconnaissance satellite. The Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft and its crew of three returned from the ISS this week, bringing to a close a record-breaking mission. The spacecraft undocked from the station's Prashal module on September 27th at 7.54 UTC, followed by touchdown of its descent module a few hours later at 11.17 UTC on the steppes of Kazakhstan. On board were Roscosmos cosmonauts Sergei Prokopiev and Dmitry Patelin, and NASA astronaut Frank Rubio. All three had originally launched in September of 2022 on board the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft, and the original plan was to return as normal on that same capsule after a six-month stay. However, in December of last year, a leak on the spacecraft's cooling systems resulted in the decision to return the astronauts on the MS-23 spacecraft instead, which launched without a crew in February of this year. Due to this, the crew has been on the ISS for well over a year, becoming the first full crew complement that has stayed on the station for that long. Frank Rubio also broke the record for longest stay in space in a single mission by an American astronaut. And this record now stands at 370 days, 21 hours, and 23 minutes. 
However, none of the Soyuz MS-23 crew members have broken the record for the longest human spaceflight ever, as that is still a record set by the Russians in the 1990s with Valery Polyakov staying on the Mir station for 437 days. It's definitely likely that both NASA and Roscosmos have interest in these long duration missions, even if they happen by accident, like in this case. So maybe in the near future, that record will be broken again. With the departure of the Soyuz MS-23 spacecraft, the ISS has now moved from Expedition 69 to Expedition 70 with ESA astronaut Andreas Mogensen as its new commander. NASA continues to make great progress with the preparations for Artemis II. Last week it was the launch pad and the astronauts, this week it's the rocket propulsion systems that have been in the spotlight. All of the RS-25 engines needed for the Artemis II core stage have now been installed, and teams are preparing everything to secure and test them over the next few months. Two of these engines are veterans of the space shuttle program, whereas the other two are new and made with spare components that were left after the shuttle retired. Once all hardware installations and tests are complete, the core stage will be transported to the Kennedy Space Center ahead of stacking on the mobile launcher. And there, waiting on the mobile launcher, will be the rocket solid rocket boosters, which arrived this week at the Cape all the way from Utah. These boosters had been in storage for a few years at Northrop Grumman's facilities in Promontory, but with the Artemis II mission slowly approaching, NASA gave the go-ahead to move them down to the launch site for pre-launch preparations and stacking. All 10 segments of these two boosters arrived via rail, as is now customary since the shuttle program. The segments will be carried to NASA's Rotation Processing and Surge Facility for processing and preparation. There, the aft skirts of the boosters will also be integrated with the aftmost booster segments before transportation to the Vehicle Assembly Building. These segments will then be placed on the mobile launcher, starting rocket stacking operations for Artemis II. Under current schedules, stacking is set to begin around February, but given the fluidity of SLS schedules, and I'm sure you know this very well, it could move a bit to the right just a few more months. But in any case, it is definitely exciting to see how every part of this mission is stacking up, as it were, to prepare for the return of humans to the moon in more than 50 years. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. SpaceX continues to build up its crew access tower at Space Launch Complex 40 with the recent rollout of the next two sections of this new structure. The sections were rolled out last week and they've already been stacked at the launch pad. Another section remains for the top of the tower, so keep an eye on Space Coast Live to watch when it happens. NASA's Mars helicopter Ingenuity has broken yet another record on its 60th flight. Yes, 60th flight! Last week it broke the record for highest powered flight on Mars, and this week it broke the record for fastest. The new record flight speed is now 8 meters per second, or about 29 kilometers per hour. Now sure, it's not the speed of a jet aircraft, but come on, that little thing is on Mars! Definitely amazing to see how much it's done though, given that it is completely experimental, and don't forget, it was originally planned to only take 5 flights! A team of astronomers have identified carbon dioxide on the surface of Europa by using data from the James Webb Space Telescope. The discovery is kind of a big deal because up until now, it was unknown if carbon-based molecules were present on the Jovian moon, especially on its surface. The data also suggests that this carbon dioxide may be coming from underneath the ice, where it's believed that a vast ocean of liquid water resides. It's still very, very early to draw any conclusions other than that there's definitely carbon dioxide and there seems to be some mechanism that drives it up to the surface. But you can bet that this will make the upcoming Europa Clipper mission even more interesting. ISRO has confirmed this week that while it has made attempts to contact the Chandrayaan-3 lander, it hasn't yet woken up. The spacecraft had to endure two weeks of cold temperatures with no solar power and no way to keep itself warm during that time. ISRO will continue to attempt to regain contact for the next week or so until the sun goes down again at the landing site, but it's still uncertain whether the lander will come back or not. However, this is not unexpected as the spacecraft wasn't equipped with the hardware needed to survive the lunar night, so any potential wake up would have just been a bonus. The mission is still a success either way. Rocket Factory Augsburg has given more details on its recently unveiled Argo spacecraft. According to the company, the spacecraft will feature a new engine called Phoenix, stainless steel structures, and autonomous guidance systems for rendezvous and docking. But of note, it has revealed that the re-entry module for its spacecraft will be inflatable and apparently developed under a partnership with Atmos Space Cargo, another German aerospace company. 
Definitely an interesting cargo spacecraft concept, and we'll have to see if the European Space Agency accepts it as the next European cargo transportation vehicle for the ISS. And now, let's see what's coming up next week in spaceflight. After a one-day delay, likely due to weather, a Falcon 9 is set to lift off on September 29th at 2239 UTC from Florida with another batch of Starlink satellites. Three more backup opportunities are available for that launch at 2334, 2 o'clock the next morning, and 215. If it goes up on time, this will be SpaceX's 10th launch of the month, breaking the company's record for most launches in a month. NSF will definitely be live for that when it happens, so stick around to our channel to join us. A Falcon 9 is planned to launch next week from Florida with another set of Starlink satellites. Liftoff is said to occur late in the evening local time on October 4th, which will likely be October 5th in UTC time. Virgin Galactic is planning the next flight of its Spaceship 2 space plane on October 5th. The mission, taking off from Spaceport America, will take another three passengers to the edge of space, but their names have not yet been announced. A time for this mission has also not been announced, but it's expected to be in the morning local time soon after sunrise. The launch of an Atlas V-501 is planned to take place next week, carrying a pair of prototype Kuiper satellites for Amazon. Liftoff is set to take place on October 6th, with the launch window opening at 1800 UTC. And if you were counting on the launch of NASA's Psyche spacecraft on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy next week, well, maybe stop counting for just a bit. NASA has announced the mission is being delayed to complete verifications to the spacecraft's cold gas thrusters. The launch is now scheduled to occur no earlier than October 12th, giving the spacecraft just 13 launch attempts in the current Earth Psyche transfer window. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Be sure to get your 30-day free trial and 20% off an annual premium subscription at the link below. We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.